On behalf of Melbourne Conversations, welcome to this session, Smart Cities with Digital Skins, What Will It Mean For You? Developed for Melbourne Knowledge Week 2014 in collaboration with Deakin University. And I have to say that I'm personally surprised uh, and excited about how quickly the developments around smart cities have progressed. What was in many ways just a couple of years ago, uh, forward thinking and academic discussion, is now increasingly becoming reality. In today's discussion, Smart Cities with Digital Skins, we want to try and make relevant the ways in which sensors and digital technologies are changing our cities and the way they operate. We also aim to give you a better understanding of the ways in which different stakeholders within a city are responding to the opportunities and to the challenges involved. So let me now introduce our guests for tonight. William Confalon Ieri is the Chief Digital Officer with Deakin University. Professor Marimuthu Palaniswamy Palani is the Director of Intelligent Sensors in the Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering at the University of Melbourne. Martin Jansa van Rensburg is Cisco Industry Solutions Alliance member, manager rather, for the ANZ Bank and a member of the ANZ's Internet of Everything Steering Committee. And uh, Vanessa Taholka is a broadcaster with Triple R FM's program Byte Into It, which is a uh, technology and culture program. And she's also a knowledge management consultant with the law firm Minter Ellison in Melbourne. So join me in giving them a warm round of applause. Uh, Professor Palaniswamy, uh, let's start with you. The, the central idea of the smart city with the digital skin, uh, it's a, it centres around this notion of the internet of things, or the internet of everything as it's now being termed. Just explain to us briefly what that concept actually means. We all know what uh, internet is. Internet connected to people and the impact it has done to the society. So, Imagine any of the devices that you know. So it could be a, a washing machine, it could be a fridge, it could be a car, or any object that you know, connected to the internet. And these devices communicating to one another through the internet. That's Internet of Things. That is basically how this digital skin comes about. That is, it, is it, it can really understand, it can really process locally, and it can communicate with other devices and people in a coordinated fashion, and that's the, basically the Internet of Things. And the digital skin idea is, is because we're not just talking about putting as many sensors as we possibly can across the city and in as many objects as possible, but we're talking about networking them up, creating, creating yeah. this idea of a digital skin. Yeah. It's the network really, isn't it? It is, it is the network. It is really like saying you have a technological system or ecosystems interacting with one another through Internet for the people. It is the people using the services for a particular group in a common good. A Gartner Research do an annual report card uh, each year on emerging technologies, and the latest one came out in mid-August, and the Internet of Everything, uh, according to Gartner, has now reached its peak, uh, the, the peak of the hype, uh, hype cycle. Uh, so it's right up there, and I can tell you, if you look online, uh, there is lots of lots of material about the Internet of Everything. It certainly seems to be catching the imagination of business and researchers. William, uh, in a sense, uh, this is about building, isn't it, a, a digital infrastructure within a city to support uh, the physical infrastructure that already exists there. But it's also much more than that, isn't it? Because it's, it's building a, a higher level of infrastructure on top of that physical infrastructure, isn't it? Yes. Um... <clears throat> It's, a, it's more than really uh, create a, another layer on top of the physical infrastructure. I mean, the, the, the main concept, I think, uh, behind the Internet of Things is to uh, be people-centric. I mean, it doesn't uh, make much sense to have sensors or devices to, to talk to each other if they don't have the purpose of making our life more uh, easier or more productive. So um, uh, that, that is, I think, is, is, the, is the key concept here. And it's not only about being more efficient. Of, of course, you, you can do that. But you can be more efficient managing your infrastructure. But this is m much more about how you are going to deliver better, better experience to make 
more transparent all the activities on our, in our society and how to improve the life of citizens. And, and crucially, people-centric, not just to meet individual needs, but to meet a, a, a civic need, so to meet a community's needs. Yes. Uh, uh, the, 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 the good thing here is that you can have digital intimacy, uh, being personal with every person at a massive scale. That, that is the, the great combination, and that is what this uh, Internet of Things is opening for us. Now, all of this is only possible, really, isn't it? Because sensors are getting much, much cheaper. Mm -hmm. uh, they're more abundant, but they're also, they're also becoming much more sophisticated, aren't they? Tell us about the sorts of sensors and the way they've developed over <laughs> the last few years. Uh, yes, uh, it's not, it's not only, only about sensing. I mean, the, the, the whole chain is sensing, thinking, and reacting. Uh, so you, you need those three things working together, and you need to have that intelligence somewhere. It could be where the sensor is, or it could be centrally somewhere else, but certainly that data that you are capturing needs to be processed, and you need to come to some conclusions and react in real time to provide a better service. Uh, Martin Janser van Rensburg, just bringing you in there. The, the types of sensors that we're talking about are uh, as I said, they're, they're, they're much more sophisticated than they used to be, aren't they? They're not, these are not just dumb uh, recorders, if you like, of information. Yes, I, I mean, one of the things with uh, the type of sensors that we see today is if you look at a, a building that we're sitting in right now, traditionally you would have an organisation that had a temperature sensor or a control sensor that was a two-wired, 12-volt type of device connected, and now we're seeing the organisations that used to create those type of sensors are making those sensors that they are actually an Ethernet device. Uh, we are talking uh, to companies today that want to take those big fluorescent halogen tubes or those big uh, fluoro tubes that sit inside your building and power your, your floor. They want to take that light and turn it into an Ethernet-powered light that hangs inside that building. So the sensor is not just a sensor that sits in the back end and does something. Those things are actually turning into devices that you would use on a day-to-day on -day basis. Even going as far as a door lock is turning into an Ethernet-enabled door lock that has an IP address that you can control and monitor. And from a house perspective, you might be able to sit here and if somebody wanted to get into your house to borrow a cup of sugar, your neighbour, you'd be able to open the door and look at the video camera from your house from your phone here. And those type of things that exist today as well. So there's an evolution uh, from a traditional two-wire type of sensor device into now things that connect directly to computer networks. And the sort of work that you do with Cisco, or that Cisco does in general, is about, is about uh, strengthening, about creating those networks, isn't it, that make all of, those, all of the input that's coming in from those sensors uh, worthwhile, make it practical. Back to William's point, I think one of the biggest challenges is all this data that's being created has to be turned into some sort of knowledge, and that knowledge then has to be applied to a business or to people and give them some sort of value. So what we are trying to build within Cisco is think of it as a motorway that actually allows you co to connect not just people with a laptop or your iPhone or whatever across it, but also connect all these sensors and then try and bring all these communications together uh, so that it actually ends up in either a cloud type of infrastructure that you can interact with and get data out of it, uh, but we are trying to build the platform to actually bring all these things together. Could I get you just to give us a, or, or tell us about lighting in general, particularly civic lighting, because that seems to be one of the areas, a really practical area where it's easy to understand the benefits of this Internet of Things approach, yep. the smart city approach. Yeah, we, we've actually, so, so Cisco has been working with a lot of uh, cities globally in this space, but really one of my focuses is to try and work with companies that are in Australia uh, that we can actually utilise them locally here. So we've now had lighting, lighting companies, street lighting companies come to us and said one of the biggest challenges for councils is the cost of street lighting because it still uses a traditional halogen or fluorescent type of tube that uses a lot more power, what they can do is actually put a, uh, a, a, an LED lighting system in there, but now once you've actually put that LED light system in there, they're thinking of ways on how they can use that light system to provide other types of services. So they can either count cars, 
and the city can actually use that from a planning perspective, so that if we put a sensor into that light, they can count how many cars there are. So we have a game at Etihad Stadium, we have one at the MCG, uh, and uh, you know, there's a couple of events going on in the city. They can actually figure out where the traffic's coming from, and if the traffic light system, so the same company, ironically enough, does the traffic light system and the, and the street lighting, they can actually make those interact with each other and find that data in real time and then regulate the traffic lights based on the flow of information. Right? So we're, we're, we're really talking about uh, multi-purpose systems, aren't we? So with the lighting there, it not only controls the amount of lighting in a civic space, so you're saving money there with uh, uh, the saving of electricity, uh, but as you say, you're also using it in, in different kinds of ways for all sorts of different management purposes within that civic environment. William. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to present a flip side to this uh, Internet of Things discussion, because it's not only about sensors. Um, certainly, if you have a sensor, th that sensor is not, can detect you emotion, for example, but it's not going to be able to do much with that information. It, 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 it's a lot more uh, powerful to to give the, 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 the sensor the possibility of knowing that it's you. Uh, if, if, because our physical presence doesn't ga give much information, but our cyber presence, for example, if you detect my uh, mobile and you know what my uh, uh, cyber ID is, you can do a, a lot more. How this is uh, working with the Internet of Things is through beacons. It's not only about uh, sensing devices, it's about devices that are sending uh, signals for your device to detect them and react to the position where you are located. So there are a lot of smart, smart things happening based on that, uh, on that flip side. Uh, identifying a, a beacon and your application reacting. You are in front of the shop, so you, you, you receive an offer immediately on your device because uh, that beacon is sending you that signal. So that's another side to the sensor uh, uh, Vanessa Tohoka, bringing you into the discussion, because uh, you're very much people-focused in, in terms of this discussion, aren't you, in this sort of development, and as, as William's saying, the, uh, these, these systems, these networks also incorporate people. We're also in there uh, providing data because of the way we're all connected at the, at the moment. So we have to think really carefully about how we decide to give permission for our information to integrate with other things and go, is this mashup delivering value to me that's going to be useful? Do I want my tweets to sync up with this so that a device might know my mood, for example? Um, there, you just reminded me of this great example. Uh, in Britain, there's a fledgling group of developers working on using, uh, increasing the accessibility of bus transportation for people who are either um, uh, struggling with accessibility issues or just visitors to a town and people who don't know the geography of a place and using push notifications from bus stop beacons so that as you're approaching it, it gives you contextual information about the sort of um, transport you can get from this area and where it will take you. And if that's not useful to you, the nearest other places you can go to to then uh, jump off to different different parts of the network. And then once you're actually on side the, on, like inside the bus, the information changes to being contextual for, um, I know you're in the moving vehicle, now I'm going to show you the different areas you can stop. If you choose one of those, I'll d give you a quick buzz when you're approaching it, so you don't have to watch your phone the whole time. And I'll also tell you all the other bits of transportation that you can hook up to after you get to that point. That's called buzz stop, and it's in development. But that's the sort of uses that we're starting to see. So importantly, there are, there, are, there are benefits there for the individual, mm. but it's also, it's also then about making that individual's experience of the city, moving through the city in this case, making it more streamlined because there is a benefit for everyone within that community if we're all moving in a streamlined way through the city. So there's an individual benefit, but there's a system benefit, isn't there, for the wider community. So in that sense, uh, we're talking about, yes, there are a lot of smart people, a lot of researchers who are working on this. There's development top down, but there's also organic development, isn't there? There's development coming from people up. Yeah, one of the really interesting trends we're seeing is that there have always been computing interest groups 
and uh, Melbourne's a really vibrant place for that. But what we're seeing is more and more events built up around the data hack concept, saying what civic data is being released by my government, or what's, what's being released by scientific organisations, what can we access, and what can we manipulate and mash up and see how we can develop tools using this that maybe uh, councils haven't had the resources to develop or that people haven't thought of doing. So in the city of Melbourne, for example, we've got over 4,600 parking sensors and uh, they help feed into the uh, fine system so that people can be moved along from spaces. But why not build that into an app so that people can see where there's free spaces available? I mean, it, I think it's part of the plan, but there's just only so many resources. So you're seeing fledgling movements going, great, these people have released their data, maybe we can help them get on the way towards a tool that we really want to use to improve our experience of the city. Professor Palanaswamy, these systems are uh, active, they're not passive, as we've heard, but increasingly they're going to be predictive, aren't they? Or, or they are becoming predictive. There's a yes, predictive yeah. element yeah. to them. Explain that to us and, and yeah. what the benefits so, are there. So, recapping some of the discussions that we've had, um, uh, also what, uh, uh, what we have to understand, go one step above uh, and uh, conceptualize this particular system. So you have the infrastructures, the building is infrastructure, the stable is infrastructure, a lot of items are infrastructure, and we people use. And the other infrastructure that is being created for digital economy, in one sense, is a digital infrastructure. So the digital infrastructure and the physical infrastructure, they interact with each other. The new way uh, that this Internet of Things is going to do is leverage the physical infrastructure in a sophisticated way, so that you can act, actually do jobs, you can actually do sophisticated things. That's basically what we call intelligent actions. So for these things to take place, you have to use data that is being collected from these physical infrastructure items, and the process information through, the, through various ways, and make some sense out of the data. That's the knowledge that you collect. And then you act upon it. So the smart city is all about that. It is really leveraging certain resources you have in a smart way, so that you can accommodate a lot more services than what you normally can do. But it's also, isn't it, it's also, and William, perhaps you could pick up on this, it's also about utilising that data to look ahead as well. So we're not just, yeah. yes, it's real-time data, and that's great for helping us with a, you know, with a traffic problem or a lighting problem, say, the, the examples that we had before, that's happening at the moment, but, but that data also allows us, crunching that data also allows us to, to look ahead and predict what's going to possibly get, going to be a, a bottleneck in the future, Yeah, isn't it? certainly predictive analytics, what is called uh, this, this uh, function is, is one of the hot topics now. And, and we are seeing uh, in the industry a lot of movements in, in that direction. In particular, uh, we are seeing the, what is called the category of smart machines coming to help us because certainly with the Internet of Things, we are going to be producing huge volume of uh, uh, data and information. So smart machines, you mean uh, like supercomputers, basically? Um, smart machines are not necessarily supercomputers in the physical sense, but super smart software, uh, as we are seeing in the market these days, that are able to uh, understand information not from the syntact syntactic perspective, but from the semantic perspective, and make sense of what the information means in a context. So uh, with that help, we will be able to predict and to react smarter. Because a lot of, a lot of businesses at the moment, aren't they, are, are, are still in that, that frame of mind that they know they should be collecting as much data as possible. Yeah. Maybe uh, an example. Have they got, have they got to the, the stage yet where they're, are we at the stage where they're, they're now thinking, right, okay, collecting is one thing, what do we do with it all? Yes. I think uh, there are a lot of uh, companies and government organisations do collect data. But if you don't really use the data, you don't really make sense of the data, the knowledge that comes out of the data, the data has got no meaning. So it's this particular process is all about extracting useful information out of this massive data. That's the reason why these big data questions uh, come about. I just want to touch upon the earlier question that you mentioned. Something happened yesterday. There is a lot of flooding in the streets yeah, in Melbourne. And there's already a news saying, you go, don't really drive into this flooded street. But you don't know what the flooded street is. So if there is a smart internet of things, it will know, it will predict where the, which streets are going to be flooded. And then it will really alert the drivers moving into that area that, yes, these are the streets that are going to be, you've got to reroute the map 
and then you can take some actions so that you don't go, go into it. At the moment, if you really say that it's flooded state, you don't know which state is flooded. Mm. So in th that, that can be one of the apps that can come out of this kind of process. Similarly, a lot of businesses can exploit the information that is already available through various mechanisms uh, and come up with uh, business processes that really can solve some problems. Vanessa, um, knowledge management is, a, is an area that you're uh, particularly focused on. And this is, it is a significant problem, isn't it? Because we are at the stage where we're where we are collecting so much and, and and you know the the sorts of systems that we're talking about as i said right at the beginning this is no longer theoretical i mean it is being rolled out in all sorts of different ways across this city and across various other cities i think we have to look at um, both sides of the equation yes it's great to have all this data that we can do things with but we really need to collect with purpose and uh, the librarian half of me also thinks that we really have to look to our information privacy principles, which have been superseded recently by the Australian privacy principles, and really think about um, always answering the questions, why are we collecting it? Are we collecting more than we need? Yes, it's a nice idea to, to collect lots and lots. And then on the other side, once you've got this data, we've got a real dearth of um, data analysis uh, skills in the workforce. There's, there's some of them there, but it's a really massively expanding um, field. There's lots of opportunities. And uh, we want people to be more data literate and to be thinking about how to solve these problems. You, you hear about collecting, say, sensor information from roads and things and, and making transport systems work efficiently and going, great, so we get one algorithm. People are connected to their things. They're all working efficiently. As soon as you do that, someone comes in to disrupt that. It's like, great, I know how all these ants are going to be flowing through a system. I want to be the person who goes against the wave. So suddenly, you've got to have dynamically generating algorithms and things reacting to other things reacting. And this is where the real time factor comes in so much. So, so much of the data we have access to at the moment isn't real time. We're looking at it, we're analyzing it in the past and going, this tool might work if we could get the real time data. So there's a lot of catching up that needs to happen, both on the, the people side with the skills and uh, the data being released and balancing that with our privacy and people's awareness of how to, how to navigate all of these different complex things. Martin, picking up on that point, uh, organizations and businesses like to have networks that they can control as Vanessa just pointed out, I mean, you're going to have people, I mean, what we know about the digital world is that it's enormously disruptive at times, and people go out of their way to be disruptive, and sometimes that's a problem, but oftentimes that's a driver of innovation. Dealing with uh, being able to incorporate that disruption is, is an issue, isn't it? Um, look, the amount of technology that's being deployed in this space, and actually the advantages that can be pulled out of it has to be weighed up. Um, and it comes back to, I think all of us have already, already mentioned the benefit that you have to get out of the data. Um, I think one of, the, one of the disruptions, a lot of people talk about, well, this internet of ing things. I mean, there was a, an article in uh, the Financial Review last week uh, about, will we see a driverless car on the road in Australia within the next five years, right? And this disruption that you can imagine if you had to take the taxis off the roads in, in, in Melbourne and replace them with driverless vehicles. So what does that mean from a, uh, the people that are driving the taxis today, the drivers, and what happens to their job? But one of the ways that we've seen the disruption in that technology might be, well, today, one driver might actually have one very large cab that he looks after, but if the disruption happens, he might have six that he looks after, they're much smaller, and they cover a smaller footprint, and he actually upskills his capability to do something else. We're seeing, and, and this has been, been happening through history all the time, what the Industrial Revolution did. And if you look at the evolution of how the technology has moved, or the three phases of, of the IT world, the first phase was about productivity. So the 1960s and 70s and 80s, when the first IT computers came up and the typing pool disappeared and you got computers and things that got created. And then the internet came around in the 1990s and there was a massive disruption in the industry again. Now we're seeing the internet of things or the internet of everything is that third wave of disruption that's actually going to change things. But the biggest difference between the third disruption, which is the internet of things, and the first two is this time it's not just processes that's being changed, it's actually the products that you use and it's the, the smart technology that's being put into the end of device that's going to drive a lot of disruption as well. 
And that's, that's a big, big difference. Can I add on, on your example? Because uh, these, these disruptions ha have the, the, the particularity that they are combining and, and producing more and more effects. If we go to the, ca the case of uh, the driverless car, it's not only affecting the, the taxi driver industry. I have three cars at home, uh, most of the, the time parked, doing nothing. So if I, have, if I have a driverless car, it's going to take me to my job, it's going to return to pick uh, uh, my daughter up, take her to the university. So it, the, the car industry is going to be disrupted. We are not going to have waste in the use of car, for example. And, and that is a, 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 a ripple effect that we will see with every single thing. And just to be clear, the reason why the driverless car is uh is related or is connected to this idea of the Internet of Things is because driverless cars, the, the, the idea is that they wouldn't be operating autonomously within a city. Yeah. Uh, they would all be connected to each other or within a network. So again, there's, there's those kind of savings with traffic because you're, you're actually keeping traffic flowing through a city in a way that uh, we currently can't do when all cars are autonomous as they already as they, as they are currently. Yep. S S Cisco has uh, co-invested in a company called Coda Wireless, which is based out of Adelaide. What they are creating is what they call car-to-car -car communication and car-to-infrastructure communication. So what that means is if the traffic light, not just the sensor and the pads that you stop on, but if the traffic light was smart enough to know how much traffic was coming to the MCG for a game and know where the traffic was coming from, you need the car to talk to the infrastructure, but also to avoid accidents and collisions, you need cars to be able to talk to each other. So in a few countries around the world, in America and in the UK, they are actually looking at putting legislation in that all new cars from a certain year would have to have the capability to speak to other vehicles on the road so that they can actually stop accidents and collisions around blind corners. If those things were coming, you were coming around the blind corner, an accident hotspot, if the cars knew that they were coming, they could actually identify that. But that opens a big, big risk because one, one big topic with this Internet of Things is cyber security. Mm. With everything connected, everything is open to be hacked. Mm -hmm. If we have cars that can be hacked and someone can hack your brake system while you are driving, we move from cyber security or cyber attack having physical consequences. So this is a really huge topic. And connected to that, uh, Palani, is also liability issues as well, isn't there? Not, not just the systems being corrupted, but uh, the systems yeah. breaking down, people looking for someone to blame. Yeah, absolutely. The, the legality issue is massive. And, but in terms of uh, the positive assurances, there are various levels of security. Even before this, there was security, and the internet had other security issues. The internet things alone is not really going to be you know, immune from any of the security issues. So it depends on the sophisticated software that you employ. There are a lot of groups working to make internet of things secure. And uh, the commercial players coming because of the, the, the liability issue that you mentioned. So as soon as you ha have these issues resolved, then it will, it will come to the marketplace. So it is really talking about the foundations of this. Unless these questions are resolved, it will never really come to the practical place. But the security issue for the Internet of Things is going to be the same as the security issue that we've had for the last uh, 10, 15 years with the Internet, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be... Uh, not just, it's not just one challenge to overcome. This is going to be a series of ongoing challenges over time to keep, yeah, to keep pace a, with. Yeah, that is the massive challenge because one of the recent government uh, organisations report overseas mentioned that because of the encryption technologies, they are not able to penetrate any of the data. So it is really a, the magic, ma massive problem. The commercial organisations are continually, because they are going to develop apps and other software items, and those items are going to impact somebody else's lives and they're liable. So they will really invest money to protect that particular software, you know, so, you know, intrusion capabilities of any, anyone affecting that particular software's capabilities. So they will really put investment into it. It's also a case of the security has to be built in right at the foundation of the product rather than being bolted on later on. It's not like when you have a company in the 1990s and you got hacked from outside, so what you did is you quickly put a firewall and then that was going to save all your problems. That's not how this is going to work. You have to actually embed the security inside the software at the first level before it even gets put into the device, and then you keep building on the layers of security as you go so through. So in that sense, IT then has to be leading the design process, doesn't it? 
it, it does, and it actually is. That's one of the biggest opportunities in this space. So when we talk about job creation and software developers and all the people that have to work on these products, I mean, you now have car companies that are hiring lots and lots of software developers mm -hmm. because between Android and Apple, the two of them are arguing on who is going to control the dashboard in your car. Because if your car drives itself, they're going to argue about who gives you the entertainment, right? Yeah. Vanessa, you Forget want to that. I'm wondering who's going to fine us for speeding as, <laughs> when they know where our car's moving and there's sensors in the roads and everything. Speeding's going to be a thing of the past and with the automatically uh, driven cars. It's just, just not going to be possible. It'll be very interesting. Um, uh, I, sorry, I just wanted to pick up on the point before that. It also comes back to that, that rigour in the data collection where we need to build in um, standards about, OK, at this point, we need to anonymise data, even though we want to crunch the mass numbers. You know, when do we strip the individuals away from that when we can still get results? Yeah. Um, there was some information about just using the internet as a whole, even if you opt out of social networking and Facebook and what have you, just through your personal connections, people can infer all these things about your socioeconomic status, you know, your background, your likely political views, mm. all these sorts of powerful bits of data. When you've opted out, we're going to have even worse problems when you might opt out of having your, uh, your Fitbits or your Garmin's, and uh, we've got a few devices surrounding me at the moment. But um, what happens if your family is using all of those? You know, what are they going to be able to infer about your lifestyle? And, yep. you know, and, and how much do you care? Are there going the to be the issues? The security issue, it, it's, the important thing about it is that it relates to fear, doesn't it? And really, fear is the great, it's the great challenge to the innovative side of this actually coming, coming to the fore. Because if people don't feel like they can trust it, they're less likely to engage with it, aren't they? Well, people are scared of not knowing what the data is going to be used for. So Chicago just won an award in America for actually being a, a completely transparent uh, council or, or city that to the extent that everybody's salary, all employees that work for the, the city of Chicago, their details are published and their salary on an external website. They have 300 data, different data sets that they publish out there, and they've taken the stance that transparency is the best way to, give it, to, to tell people what they're doing. Um, so that, so that, that's driving one, one component of that, and people wanting to have the ability to assess the data. And, what is available to them and how their data is being used. If, if, if your supermarket chain gave you the option to opt in with them if you were trying to save for a holiday at the end of the year and they would actually help you procure your products through the year in the shopping market so that you could get a goal of taking your two kids and your wife on a holiday at the end of the year, people would opt in because you would know what the data was going to be used for, what they collected from how your buying cycle was being used for, right? So it it's all comes back to the fear of people not knowing what their data is going to be used for. And, and for the, and I'll come to you, Pilani, in just a second, but for the, the idea of the Internet of Things to work uh, for a, a, a smart city, and so take a, a city like Melbourne, building that, that kind of trust in, in almost establishing contracts, if you like, uh, between people and the, the networks, and the, that, that can't happen on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on what system uh, you're using, because we, we're talking about network systems that, as we said before, are not just sophisticated, but they're multi-purpose. So if we're talking about uh, civic benefit overall, we're also talking about civic authorities having to be involved in that, that contract, that trust yeah. process, aren't we? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, the, uh, there's a lot of debate that has been going on over the past few years. Uh, and the general understanding is that if for Internet of Things to be successful, it is the partnership between government organizations and civil authorities, civic authorities, et cetera, and, pri and private organizations, which will create services for commercial good on, on, uh, to serve the community, and citizens. These three, people, these three sets have to work together to make it really work for this to be successful. And the trust issue is one of the important issues. If the citizens are to participate, the trust has to be absolutely established about, beyond doubt. And for that, there are several research organizations that have come together, so we are part of one organization in the European clusters. And that's, that's to really make how, how do you really engage citizens, at what level they can really feel confident, and in, in order for the purpose of collecting data or engaging them. That is really a massive project. So mm -hmm. unless we solve that problem, unless we bring citizens into the Internet of Things, 
at their comfort level. It is not going to take off because it's ultimately we are serving the citizens. Pilani, have you been following the example of uh, Christchurch post the earthquake? They've got a really interesting program going on where um, because they're rebuilding their city, they have a unique opportunity to embed the sensor technologies in right from the start. So they're yeah. working, uh, one of the ways they're embedding them is in roads. Um, also, they're doing it in water quality because they've had water quality issues after the earthquakes. And uh, they're also doing it with air quality and uh, they're tapping into uh, people who suffer from asthma within the community. Sure, yeah. And uh, every time they're actually taking a, a breath from their puffer, they're doing an air sample at the same time to try and um, match up factors that might be um, playing into, into respiratory problems. So it's, it's interesting seeing a city do that so successfully already. They've got some advantages in that they're a relatively small population. Small, yeah, yeah. yeah, but um, they're doing some good work. And just a reminder about the subject of today's discussion and our panellists, Smart Cities with Digital Skins is the name and the topic. How sensors and sensor-based systems, but more than that, as we've heard, are transforming the city and its services and potentially leading to greater civic engagement. I'm Anthony Fennell from the Future Tense program on RN, ABC Radio National. And our, a reminder about our panellists, they are Professor Maramuthu Palanaswamy, the Director of Intelligent Sensors in the Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering at the University of Melbourne. Vanessa Tahoka, a broadcaster with Triple R FM's program Bite Into It. She's also a knowledge management consultant with the law firm Minter Ellison in Melbourne. Martin Janza van Rensburg, Cisco Industry Solutions Alliance Manager for the ANZ Bank and a member of the ANZ's Internet of Things, Internet of Everything Steering Committee. And William Confalonieri, the Chief Digital Officer with Deakin University. And our Twitter hashtag is hash knowledge city, all one word. Uh, William, the first show that, the first time that my program, Future Tense, looked at this concept of the Internet of Things was back in 2009. And at that stage, no one really that I can remember was talking about the cloud. What kind of difference do, has, has cloud computing and the emergence of that and the emphasis on that by so many organizations and, and companies, what kind of difference has that made to the, the sort of ability to build this, the networks that we're talking about today? Well, uh, cloud is basically to have some uh, computer power and computer storage somewhere else where do you know where it's located to be able to escalate, uh, to have a, 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 yeah, the flexibility to escalate as you need uh, to, to deal with information. So uh, in this context is, uh, uh, one core component, uh, but we are seeing, as we have been discussing, that that configuration of having the cloud helping us to deal with all the information that we are collecting uh, might not be enough. Uh, there is another interesting concept called fog computing instead of cloud computing that is referring to have some local intelligence where the sensors are to really uh, understand what is relevant of all that data, apply uh, immediately the reaction to, to what you are detecting, and disregard everything else to avoid the traffic to the cloud and to, and to uh, pass the responsibility to the, cent to the center to make some decision that can take time to react to the local uh, event. So the analysis of the data is happening with fog computing at the point of collection? Yes. If we, we were, in, in, in a case like this, if we were, uh, uh, with, uh, we were here with plenty of sensors detecting some things and, and, and reacting to, to us, I don't know, could be light, could be temperature, could be many other things, uh, potentially we will have a smart uh, algorithm uh, or a smart computer here uh, try dealing with that information, making the decisions, applying the changes to the environment and disregarding the rest, not s probably sending a portion of that to a central cloud uh, venue to later uh, make some analysis of that. You know? And once again, this is, about, uh, this is about data management, isn't it? Making sure that your system basically doesn't get clogged. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in particular, it's interesting because this is uh, really uh, explo exploding the, the whole uh, or the complete sequence of uh, information management. It's data collection at the, at the sensor uh, at the sensor point, is maybe having uh, uh, some intelligence locally to convert that uh, data information, applying some 
context information. <coughs> if you go uh, to, the, to the center, to the cloud, where you have more analytic tools, you, you convert that uh, information in, in, into knowledge. And if you apply that knowledge in changing some process, you are uh, going to the wisdom part of the equation. So it's interesting how uh, this Internet of Things is, is, is expanding over the four level of information management. Martin, your thoughts on that? So uh, fog computing is a construct that basically, uh, and there's two versions of it. So uh, if you look at the consumer world, I have a jawbone. I don't know how many of you guys have got a jawbone. What I have on my, uh, on my iPhone is an app that takes the data, this talks via Bluetooth to my phone, and it literally uh, collates the data on my phone and tells me how many steps I've taken or how well or bad I've so slept So just to be night. clear for people, if they're not familiar, a, a jawbone is, it's, it's a, a bracer basically wear on your wrist, but yes. it's, it's, uh, it's collecting biometrics on you, isn't yep. it? So it has quite a lot of intelligence inside it that it actually counts every single step that I take. So I try and do quite a few steps a day to keep myself a bit fit. So what I do is I link this up to my iPhone and it collects the data in a little application of how many steps I've taken in a day. And then what it does is instead of setting every single step that I've taken to the cloud, what the app on my phone does, it actually collates the data and sends a message up every hour or every, that sends the consolidated data. Now fog computing in the, in, the, in the commercial world would be if you had your ADSL modem at home that connects you to the internet and you had all your products in the house was LG, fridge, freezer, the whole works, and all those things were connected to the internet, you could drag an application from LG into your little modem at home and be able to control all your devices and it'll tell you, you know, Johnny's left the fridge open again or you're out of milk, right? It'll be able to provide you some sort of information. And that application, is the fog, or like William said, the intelligence that you put right at the edge where those devices are. And one of the other benefits of not sending everything to the cloud is it actually saves you energy because you're not actually using electricity and the data to store all those useless pieces of data. And it also saves you bandwidth, so the amount of information you can send out that ADSL link from your house, it actually saves you the bandwidth component of it as well. The uh, CSIRO have a really cool project where they're using this principle. Um, they started the project down in Tasmania. They were trying to investigate the phenomenon of, um, of the collapse of bee colonies. And so they, they had these tiny little 2.5 millimeter square sensors that they, they cooled the bees down, put them to sleep, um, glued sensors to them. Uh, they glued, I think, 5,000 sensors and uh, across a number of beehives. Now, these were RFID sensors, which you might know work a bit like an e-tag, so that they have to pass a checkpoint of some sort for a, a movement to be registered. But bees act in very prescribed ways. And what they could do with this information was notice when bees deviated from the patterns. And that information would be collated at each hive. And so uh, they didn't need to keep going back to each hive and just checking on the data. They could say, the data would be crunched, it would look for anomalies. If there was an anomaly, then people could come out and have a look around, see what was actually different, maybe set up sensors in a different way to get new information. And uh, that was a really creative use and a, and a scientific research use of, of Internet of Things, rather than maybe just these, uh, these first world problem sort of things and, and uh, personal analysis that we try and do, which is also a bit of fun. But. Yep. Pro Professor Balamaswamy, you wanted to jump in? Oh, no, just wanted to give, you, give an example for this particular cloud. Uh, interacting with the Internet of Things. I, I think cloud is a very powerful medium for Internet of Things to be successful. Uh, consider this example, uh, and that, that uh, there's, a, there's a robot, a yeah, working robot, which can really help you uh, uh, rescue people in a fire accident. It could go. And there'll be a number of cameras placed in different locations. And these cameras are things that are connected to the Internet. They'll be pumping data into the cloud. And the cloud, the cloud, you can really have a lot of services. You can count people, you can count scenarios, et cetera. There are a lot of sophisticated processes that you can really uh, put in the cloud. And one can, a sensor can activate any of the processes, depending on what it needs. It can really understand this. the smoke conditions, it can understand the number of people in the building, or the people around, et cetera, or the obstacles, all those things you can do. So you can really hire any of the services as software as a service. And then that will be process, that process, intensive processes will be computer, computer in the cloud. 
and the data will be stored in the cloud. And the action can, the actual actions can be communicated through the internet to the action items, such as a robot. So this is really powerful medium. So these local sensors do not have to have so much computing power, so much memory power, or so much action items. So all those things can really be combined interactively with the cloud so that you can really have for some very sophisticated jobs done. Uh, William, you're with Deakin University. Uh, universities like Deakin have, in one sense, they've, they've provided a microcosm, haven't they, for the development of the Internet of Things. They've, they've in a way, been early, well, not in a way, they have been early adopters of the technology and they've been testing out a lot of the, the systems that uh, we're talking about today, haven't they? Yeah, well, if we, we discuss a, a specific area of Internet of Things, that is smart cities, as we are discussing today, certainly universities have an advantage because we, our campuses are smart, small cities. We have most of the issues and, 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 and uh, problems that uh, a city can have. We have parking, is parking issues, we have shops, we have banks, we have everything in, in, inside the campus. So we can experiment uh, a small scale uh, all the opportunities in relation to what the uh, Internet of Things for small, small cities can bring. Uh, additionally, uh, in, in the case of Deakin, certainly we are pushing a very ambitious agenda in terms of personalization. We want to react to every student, to every stakeholder in general with a very personal experience. Uh, what we can take from the retail side of things, of the Internet of Things, uh, uh, giving a very personal experience when you walk in a shop and, and, and pushing your direction, uh, really things that are going to augment your experience, also can be transported to the university. We want to have an augmented experience to, to really lay on top of uh, the physical campus, another virtual campus that is going to react to you and provide you with a powerful, personal, inspiring experience. And I would presume that it's, it's also an opportunity for the university, so for the students of the university, to be involved in the creation of those kind of systems or the perfection of those kind of systems. Of course. I mean, uh, this is, this is a, a, a partnership. We, it's not only about the universities uh, doing that, but we, we also have students studying the disciplines that are contributing to that, in, in particular IT, for example, as many others. So we involve them in, in, the, in, the, in the shared creation of this reality. Mm -hmm. Vanessa. Oh, I was just wondering, are, are you using any of those technologies in wayfinding or room management of or course, any of those things of at course. the moment? Well, I mean, uh, we, we are working on uh, smart parking, we are working on uh, wayfinding. Uh, we delivered um, uh, some time ago uh, virtual reality, sorry, augmented reality based navigation of the campus so you, you can see extra things that you don't see normally when you are navigating the campus. With I hear your that's mobile. a common university experience. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and certainly uh, we can translate on the spot. If you are uh, uh, a student from another country, you can translate on the spot uh, the, 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 all the, the, the signs and, and, and everything to your uh, home language, for example. Now, we'll come to questions in just a few minutes, but before we do, I, I, William, staying with you, I wouldn't mind talking about some of the cities that have been identified as, as leading this process, or certainly being in the vanguard of this change. You've just come from a global forum in Chicago yes. on the internet of, of everything. Now, Chicago and Barcelona is the other city that often come up when people talk about this. What is it about those two cities that makes them, or that puts them in a position, or has put them in a position to utilize uh, this development? Well, I think the first thing is the mindset. They have a proactive position to really take advantage of, 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 it, of, of this. Uh, they, they understand the business case behind the investment. They put the investment there, and they are really becoming another category of city. Now they are competing with other smart cities to attract more business, more innovation. Really, this is going to push everyone else to move in that space because they, they, they are seeing the, the return of the investment of, of this moment. So the, 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 the answer is mindset is the first thing. After that, of course, a, a lot of other things. You need to see the big picture. You need to understand how the Internet of Things is going to change 
a structure because it's going to change the structure of government, it's going to change the structure of organization because uh, you need to have an event-oriented architecture to put in some way. You need to design, I mean, just to use an example, if, the, if your rubbish bin is going to let you know when it's full, you don't need to have a truck going everywhere uh, to, 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 to collect that garbage. You need to design your organization to react to the signal that you need to go. And you, with that, you change completely the structure of your organization. So this is going to be a massive shift in the way that we are organize uh, ourselves in, in any organization. And we know that cities are increasingly competitive. I mean, Melbourne's a very competitive city. It talks itself up a lot. Uh, it, you know, it, it, it talks about itself as a city that's able to attract uh, innovators as well as business. So th this is a city coming on board with this idea of the Internet of Everything that fits, fits in very much, doesn't it? It's very attractive to that idea of uh, creating an ecosystem, if you like, for innovative people. Absolutely. This is, uh, uh, the, the Internet of Things is a, it's a great technology. It's a great enabler for solving problems. For any city to be a smart city, that they all have to have, must have a vision. If some cities, for example, Detroit, might be a serious problem, maybe job creation. So you really have to have the kind of tools and uh, uh, the software process, et cetera, to, for the purpose of uh, creating jobs. But as another city like Melbourne, it is a knowledge city. It is really a vision to innovate and create new things, et cetera. So then you organize your structures so that these tools can be created so that the people can participate in this uh, technology to innovate things. Mm -hmm. That's the atmosphere that you create. And the same thing for other people. So some other cities in the, in the developing world, maybe uh, pollution may be a serious problem. So if you don't solve pollution problems, you solve something else. That pollution problem can overtake the other advantages that you already created. So therefore, a city should really have that kind of vision to start with and organize itself with a vision so that you can really move things forward. Now, you're with the University of Melbourne, and you've been working on this idea of the Internet of Everything for, for quite some years now, yeah. but you've also been doing work uh, in, the, in the EU. Tell us a little bit about that and about the size of the investment that the EU is making uh, in this approach. So the EU has got an Internet of Things cluster, the IERC cluster, they call it, and they put over 100 million euros into this particular program. And the, that, is, uh, that is massive in terms of uh, creating opportunities for, for their area. The one such project we talked about is how do you really engage citizens? If the citizens are not part of this project, then the, pro the project is not going to be successful. So that is one project. Another project that we are working on is called Organic City, which has basically been approved. This is over close to $10 million. And that project is all about how do you really engage businesses to be part of it? So if the businesses, for small, small to medium business, they cannot invest a couple of million dollars to see whether this idea is going to work, whether they can sell the services or not. So for those businesses, there should be a platform where they can come and sit, test their ideas, and test their usability, and then, then really take it to the marketplace. That means a common platform that you create so that the businesses can participate in this particular process. So similarly, there are a lot of other uh, opportunities created in the European Union. Similarly, the Australian Research Council is participating or providing funds to create certain opportunities. It's not the same scale as what is happening in the European Union. Europe is leading miles ahead in this area. Uh, Martin, a, 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 an Australian perspective on, on how things are going, where we sit in terms of our interest. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we're lagging. Uh, we're lagging behind in, in this innovation. There's actually a, an article today in The Age that was written exactly around the point of that Australian cities are actually lagging a little bit behind the, uh, the eight ball when it comes to deploying smart city technology. I think uh, uh, lucky Australia it's a very good lifestyle that we have here, and one of the things is a lot of the innovation that's been driven by some of these other cities have actually been done because of unemployment within the city. So they had to create innovation platforms to create employment for people. In France, they're playing around in this space as well. Um, in the city of Detroit, you can go look at how many startup organizations they're trying to form in a city like Detroit just to try and drive innovation within that city. So 
uh, even Barcelona, one of their best parts of their use cases was actually to create jobs within the city. So we've had it very good in Australia, and I think one of the things for us as an opportunity is the innovation that we can bring to the forefront within this space, the amount of startup organisations that we can bring into this space within Australia, and be a really a leader as Australia in the Asia-Pac region around this space is something that I think is, is, is really much on the table right now for us. So we don't, we don't get a big tick. Uh, <laughs> we, we haven't got a cross against our name. The, but as you say, um, you know, being an optimist, yep. there's lots of opportunity yep. out there. But civ you know, some uh, civic authorities are getting on board as well, yep. aren't they? I so, mean, they're interested. So, so in fairness, the city of Adelaide is actually one of the most forward-thinking cities around this space. They've actually got a free Wi-Fi deployment across the city right now. Um, the city of Adelaide is actually one of those places that's struggling as well because of a lot of industries is disappearing. Uh, there are cities around, the city of Geelong is very interested in this, this type of space. Uh, the city of Brisbane is working closely with some partners in this space as well. So we do have some pockets of innovation, but we've literally gotten to the point where we only have that first initial Wi-Fi put in for public use. We haven't got to the extent where we can actually connect sensors or smart traffic lights or lighting systems and things like that to actually bring the additional benefit of connecting, as Wim Alfred said, connecting the unconnected. We haven't gotten to that point yet. We're still connecting people with mobile phones and iPads. Yeah, there, there is a framework for smart cities and from the ad hoc level to the maturity level, there are five steps. Uh, I think here we are in a ad hoc in yep. some cases. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. Well, I, I'd like to touch upon the City of Melbourne. The City of Melbourne has got designated people, resources committed for smart city initiatives. There is noise mapping in the city, heat mapping in the city, and several other initiatives. That is in partnership with the Australian Research Council to do some new innovative projects. It is also in partnership with the European Union projects, which from the City of Melbourne perspective, it can access the resources and the outcomes that the other cities in Europe are able to achieve. Yep. So in that sense, City of Melbourne, the council here is very forward thinking as well. So it is really happening, but it is a lot more things need to happen to match the other city's outcomes. And as we're in Melbourne, that's good to hear that. <laughs> good to hear, yeah. uh, look, let's stop there for a second and, uh, and take some questions if people have got questions. I'm Sarah. Um, my question is about um, how these are, um, are being designed from a commercial viewpoint and the issue of brand loyalty, which we've already seen in computers, and how adaptable will be my driverless car if I drive from Melbourne to Sydney to Brisbane and I go from a PC city to an Apple city mm. to a Linux city and then back to a PC city five years ago. How, um, how much is being done to standardise and make these kinds of computers, generic systems? So there's two issues there, really, isn't there? There's the, the corporate kind of uh, um, siloing, if you like, for their own uh, commercial purposes, but there's also that issue of interoperability, of systems matching uh, between different jurisdictions. Who'd like to, to take on those two issues? William. Uh, well, uh, cer certainly that, that's a, a big topic. Uh, we, we need to go through that uh, journey in terms of uh, make things interoperable, interoperable, but I think the, the most, uh, the key thing here is uh, not about uh, ten technology per se, but is the normalization in terms of information that is required, because uh, with every system uh, classifying or understanding the, the information in a, in a different way, uh, certainly things are, are not going to work. So one of the challenges that we are uh, finding at this moment is the, the huge work of, from the, uh, one organization perspective, the huge work of normalization of data and information that you need to put um, uh, uh, before any of these things uh, can, can really deliver the value. But certainly, in, the term, in, in terms of uh, making all the technology compatible, that is, 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 uh, is something that should be at the front of, of the process as well. Martin, you're nodding your head there. Yeah, look, uh, we, from, from Cisco's perspective, and when you start looking at things like the ISO and the IEEE, when it comes to standards of communications, there's a lot of work being put in in the back end around how devices can seamlessly interoperate with each other even though they have different operating systems on them so that they can share the basic information that they need. So we're seeing a lot of 
that type of uh, 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 integration happening at the moment. And it's almost going back to what happened in the 1990s, that you used to have lots of different types of protocols that computers like a Linux or a Unix or a, or a, or a Novell system all spoke different languages and then everything standardized on IP the, or the internet protocol, which is what everybody has today that you, you connect to the internet with. We're seeing that in this, this new era of connecting all these devices, number one, like I mentioned before, everything is standardizing so you can get an ethernet port or a wireless connection to it. So that's at least the basic from a communications perspective as a standard. But then what we're trying to say is you have to create open systems that people can actually utilize to make all this stuff interoperate even though it's different vendors' products. But uh, a couple of weeks ago when I wa uh, was in Chicago, I had a meeting with the people from Tesla Motors, this luxury car that is electric, fully connected to the internet, and you can download uh, all the drivers for all the parts of the car without going to, to the, to the uh, service uh, office. Uh, and the, all the cars are connected, so you can receive uh, information about traffic from other cars from the same brand uh, that is uh, navigating in, a, in another in another place, but you don't receive information from another brand. So we, we see that organizations and, and, and vendors are moving with partial solutions to make everything work together is going to be a big challenge. Yeah, hi. I wanted to know how uh, the Internet of Things could be used for infrastructure development, particularly how the data could be used to see a need for um, new kinds of infrastructure, but also how you could also be used to model particular developments and, and, and test whether it's you know, feasible and could be done to sort of fast track that and speed it up and get better outcomes to sort of determine whether a, a road tunnel or a rail tunnel or a better option for a city, something like that. Well, at the moment, uh, the, the way people uh, try to use it is, as I mentioned earlier on, is you have the physical infrastructure and the digital infrastructure. And the digital infrastructure includes simulations, software programs, and other processes. So they interact. And so the modeling tools basically will take current the infrastructure mechanisms, and then you can add the virtual sensors and virtual platforms uh, uh, that enable you to predict, for example, if I want to have a carbon footprint of such and such, and what kind of uh, populations could I really have? What kind of buildings can I really have, et cetera? So that will really put a cap on what, what is possible. Or you know, alternatively, supposing there is a constraint that this many roads can only be built, this many build, the story level, the height of the building is only so much, then you can really simulate it and, and, and in such a way that the planning can really be sensible. So these are doable. This, that's basically what I mean by the f physical infrastructure and the digital infrastructure interacting through some sophisticated processes. And, and certainly the Internet of Things is very valuable at the moment of a, a smart assignation of resources once you have those resources. Uh, if we have this space, we can, we can know in real time what is the usage of this building or this space, and we can make decisions in real time or later in terms of how we can ass assign some other activity here. So once you have the resources, the, the, the sensors and the intelligence is going to provide you information to really make a better, a more efficient use of all the resources you have. If we go to the, to the domain of a university, we have many, many buildings. It's interesting to know how, uh, how the students are traveling around those buildings and to understand where we need to deploy more resources and where we can potentially send another activity because that building is empty most of the week. So that is real-time information to a smart assignation of resources. And a, and a really quick example from the mining industry would be they are extremely interested in getting sensor information out of the mine analyzing their big data, and then basically running a model over the mine that says, well, if I wanted another 80,000 tons of iron ore out of my mine, how do I affect my conveyor belts, my crusher, my train line, and how many more drivers do I need so they can use it from a modeling perspective? So the mines are actually quite innovative in this space already. Is data a new currency, or is it a new oil? <laughs> do you agree or disagree on this? Sorry, is, is data the new currency? Or data a new currency, or is it a new oil in our digital world? I've read uh, this statement, I think, in one of the magazines. Ah, the yeah. new oil. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There, was, there, was a, there was a, I think it was in one of the magazines, there was this pyramid that showed that basically said that 
data is now worth more than what oil is. So that the importance of collecting all this data and analyzing and getting the knowledge out of it is becoming more important than yeah, oil. Yeah, some, some say, say, say that data is the new natural resource. But the reality is we are going to be inundated with data. So we, I, I, data per se doesn't have that much value. Uh, in particular, this year, we human beings are going to produce more data and information that the volume that we have produced from the origin of time till next, uh, till, till last year. So it's amazing the volume that we are producing and that is going in a, in a, in a uh, exponential direction. So um, how to extract intelligence from that data is the key. Uh, if that helps with the answer. And just, uh, just on that point, I, I saw uh, an estimate uh, just recently from a report conducted by the firm Morgan Stanley, and uh, they estimated that by the year, or they estimate that by the year 2050, the number of devices connected to the Internet, internet of Things will be around 75 billion. <laughs> so, so that's a, if they're all generating data, that's an awful lot of data uh, to be generated. The, yes, the, ne the next question. My question is for the next generation. Accepting that we're going to form these um, digital skins with our cities, how are we going to train the next generation to think for themselves if they are going to be brought up with this internet of everything, that they're not going to learn any common sense? How are they going to learn to think for themselves and any problem solving if everywhere they go, they'll be outside a shop and they'll be buzzed by some sensor? I mean, I can accept it for us, but what's this going to do to the next generation, knowing the effect that the internet and um, computer games are having on their brain development now? How are they going to learn to lo uh, lay down nerve pathways? Vanessa, did you want to pick that up? Yeah. Um, as someone who's grown up with computer games and things, you can see it's really retarded my development. <laughs> I, think, I think it's a really natural um, worry to have about how, how a technology is being so pervasive, going to change the way we're educated. Um, fortunately, we go through this wonderful period of adolescence where we question everything and it's vital to us maturing and uh, that's going to be a very helpful stage of progression to go through when you're interacting with these technologies and critically analysing them and looking at them and wanting to disrupt systems. I think we're probably going to learn a lot from how teenagers interact with this because they'll be natives for this next generation of technology. So I wouldn't be worried about them. I'd, I'd think, wow, how exciting to be born at a time when all these different opportunities were going to be there. And we are talking about people, as you said earlier, we are talking about people feeding into these systems as well. So there is, there is I guess, opportunity for creativity. Uh, Don't you just wish sense. you knew every piece of music that you'd heard your entire life and could track your influences and, and music taste over time, just as a tiny little sample of what would be possible if you'd grown up with the Internet of Things just being pervasive in your life? I think there is also a point, isn't there, that, yeah. I mean, we're really... It's like everything to do with the digital world. We, we're, we're so in it now, we forget that it has only just begun. <laughs> it's, you know, this is, this is really, really, really early days. I want to talk one. The way that uh, these things are uh, going to move is like the olden times, you can really do manufacturing jobs and do all the dirty works, etc. And that's essential for your living. That's essential for living. And then that's shifted out somewhere else. And then you're going for a new sector. And the other world jobs, you don't want to take it. So the generation, the younger people, are not going to be interested in doing a routine, boring jobs. It's, they're going to be interested in doing a lot more sophisticated jobs, which can employ the mind and the body. And that's where they want, want to do it. And that means you need to really develop their skill sets in, the, in this domain. That means the old professional skills in the Internet of Things is not going to be the professional, it's going to be basic. Once they understand basic, they will be building upon this infrastructure a lot more new sophisticated jobs, sophisticated careers out of this. And that's going to be a lot more fun and interesting, and it's going to be, going to be a sophisticated life, and that's what they would like to aspire to. Uh, another question. Uh, Austin Lee from the City of Melbourne. We're facing a dilemma at the moment with uh, sensors that we have deployed. At the moment, you don't identify people. We have the principle that you don't identify people. And there are sensors out there at the moment that can monitor uh, the presence of mobile devices. But there's always the potential that those can then be tracked back to the individual in some way. So we don't even you know, when to look at those at this stage. I'm just wondering, 
are there sort of principles that we should be adopting or that other, other cities are adopting at the moment whereby you have a level of participation perhaps which is just de-identified data but then people opt in at certain levels or is it going to be that regardless of what you do, people will always be able to cross-reference the data and identify what an individual is doing. Who wants to pick up on that? Yes, I, I can touch upon it because it's an important, you know, interesting problem that has been debated for a while. Austin picked it up uh, quite nicely. For example, uh, at, the moment, uh, the, at the moment what we say is, okay, citizens can't share the data. That is, let's take a hypothetical example. I, I would like to have some kind of encryption software put in my iPhone, and I pick some uh, data that I go, and then it, it goes to the public. All right, that's fine. Another person maybe, uh, that needs to be anonymous. I'd like to guarantee uh, of anonymity so that that information can be processed for, uh, for crowdsourcing. Another person may be sitting somewhere close by and may be collecting the same kind of information. Then if they correlate it, then they could really say, look, this person was here and he was collecting data and was sending the information. So therefore, what, what this particular uh, pro, uh, problem is quite, can be quite serious because that, the idea can be understood. So what, what happens is this information can be uh, you know, scrambled. All sorts of sophisticated mechanisms are available where the, when the information goes to the server for uh, processing, before it gets to the server, it could really be you know, scrambled and all other encryption technologies can be used so that that, that, does, that problem uh, will not arise. So that conference has to be built in so that uh, uh, the, the user is protected from any, uh, any unauthorized disclosures. Yeah, uh, certainly the, the, the process of make anonymous all the data that we are collecting these days is, is quite important to, to preserve the, the, the privacy rights. But my, my understanding is that we are entering in an area that we are unable to understand. Um, because now it's easy, but we will see billions of things having chips. Our pills are going to have chips sending messages to our doctor to see how things are working. So when we have that massive deployment of uh, microchips and sensors, and th we are going to be entering in a, a space where the concept of privacy is going to change. How? I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I think we are not able to understand the implication of this yet. Uh, and that's, I mean, again, going back to fear, that's a significant uh, innovation issue, isn't it, over time? Well, to play devil's advocate, the internet today is a platform that's based on anonymity. But if I was on an internet that I knew who everybody was, nobody would try to spam me. Nobody would try to steal my data because I knew who that person was. So I compare the internet to the Wild West and my corporate network to somewhere that I know who is on the network and I know who everybody is, right? So th there is this balancing act between the anonymity of the people that are doing things wrong and the normal people who are doing the right thing, right? That's the security through obscurity argument. Yep. However, the issue is that you can be doing the right things, but if you attract undue attention, like if you're a celebrity, you've got real problems yep. right now, as we've seen. So, yeah, it's, we haven't dealt with this. Yeah, it's a balancing so, act. So I guess the short way of answering the question is, who knows? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll to, a pretty difficult we'll have to one. wait and see. Put, put a big question mark on that one. The, the, the notion, I don't actually like the word smart city, because that's a Cisco term. Um, <laughs> And Melbourne has been voted recently the world's most livable city. So I just want to make that point to you. Um, but cities are complex and messy things and it's very dangerous to compare one city with another city because they all face lots of different challenges and Polanyi picked that up. But there's four things that consistently hit cities, population growth, climate change, disruption from ICT, and financial stability. So w how does the Internet of Things help us address these emerging issues which are, aren't going to go away? And if you're going to be a smart city, can you be smart now? We're we going to look back in 30 or 40 years and say, were we smart? Because really, running a city, and none of you really understand how to run a city, with all due respect, running a city is about stewarding the future the, for the future generations. And I think reducing it to bits and bytes and not putting the citizen at the centre of this, this discussion is a real flaw in the argument. Well, I'll let others answer, but I think we've been talking, I think the point was made right at the beginning, that we were talking 
uh, about uh, the need for it to be citizen centric, to yeah. be to be people centric. I mean, yes, we're talking about systems and technology, but I I haven't detected at least that we're we we haven't that the panelists at least haven't got people at the uh, at the centre of all this, but I'll let, yeah, let people yeah, speak yeah. for themselves. So certainly, that if, if we don't have a purpose, doesn't have. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't have a reason to have devices to talk to another device. It's just to create noise. Uh, certainly, the the goal is to have the the, the, the triple bottom uh, bottom line that is uh, economic, social, and environmental uh, benefits. If you are not uh, delivering on those three things, the initiative doesn't have uh, a reason to exist. So uh, that is the core, is to be uh, citizen-centric, of course, and to deliver on those three dimensions, economic, social, and environment. So, for example, um, one of the recent beneficiaries of a Google grant is the Melbourne-based company Info Exchange, and they've pitched a project where they're going to uh, take advantage of the fact that a lot of homeless people within the city of Melbourne have mobile phones and that um, we could really streamline the way they access services and are made aware of solutions to some of their immediate needs um, right by targeting their pocket and targeting putting data on that as well. So there are definitely people looking at um, social solutions for things. There are people looking at um, environmental benefits that we can get from the increased amount of data that we're putting out. And you heard it in the smart lighting example. And uh, it's definitely that is true of the automated cars as well. And road sensors and things can have that effect. Um, farmers, uh, there's an example of potato farmers in Egypt using a range of different sensors and mashing that with weather information to get better yields from their potato crops, but also to mean that less people have to be that out there in the harsh, you know, midday sun, um, checking on things and, and keeping, you know, really close eyes on things. They're using GPS tracking data and all these sorts of things. So there are, we're talking about real benefits that affect people. And, uh, one of the things that we're finding is not just cities that wants to do this, we're finding regions in Australia coming to speak to us and other organisations that are saying, we don't want our kids to go to the city, we actually want to build a smart region and an innovation platform that businesses can actually utilise and innovate on that we can keep our kids at home and we don't want them to come to Melbourne. So how can we create an environment that actually gives them the same type of benefits and the same environment as what this so-called smart city is going to give them, but give it to them on a region, regional basis? So, uh, Is there a point also that we're not, you're not measuring uh, this idea as a kind of alternative to what exists now, because what exists now, regardless of whether the Internet of Things is around or not, what exists now is not going to exist in three, four, five years' time. I mean, all cities develop and change, uh, so that's going to happen regardless. You know, this is one form of uh, technology or a technological approach that could, that could be changed for good or possibly changed for bad, but yeah. it's not... The only, uh, it, you know, it's not developed or not developed. That's not the equation, is it? No, no I just want to uh, touch upon one important issue. Just because that we connected digital infrastructure or digital ICT, ICT into this to solve a temporary problem doesn't make a city smart. Smart itself is a relative term. For example, I may be dumb compared to all of you guys, but then that's a relative term that I may be smart in a, in a different sense for uh, other cultures. But the, the way that we need to understand is whether it is the city is a thinking city, which means you have data, which, which Colin uh, touched upon, the data that you can reuse it for taking some smart actions. The Internet of Things is all about the city, allowing the city to think and make, make some corrective actions. So supposing an, a, a disaster takes place, the city is able to sense that information and take some processing jobs, that is thinking, based on past events that happened, and then in, uh, uh, basically allow additional action so that mitigation can take place. That's basically what the smart city is. So it can be a low probability event, but the information content is very high, and you process it so that you, have, you solve the problem. And that city, if that city has got capabilities, then it is a smart city. It is changing, it is moving, it is all the time updating its knowledge so that it, it looks smart. The, uh, the panel mentioned it a couple of times, the uh, possibility of, of benefiting the motorist with this technology. And 
this uh, device has one uh, limitation in that um, driving around with one tends to attract the attention of the police force. So what um, insights can the panel offer in terms of perhaps the ways of overcoming these limitations of uh, the, the safety, legislative and perhaps technical aspects of interacting with these systems? I believe the latest research says that it's actually quite unsafe to be interacting with uh, these devices, so that, that's problematic, but I, I haven't got the detailed information I, I th on that. I think what we're seeing is happening, and maybe back to William's example, is a lot of the manufacturers are now building GPS systems into their vehicles, and if you have TomTom, Tom, I have TomTom Tom on my iPhone, it actually has the traffic app component that you can actually pay the extra $5 or whatever it is to actually get the real-time interactive traffic map that they get. So. When it comes to the, the, the safety side of things, I think a lot of the, the, the car operators or car manufacturers are trying to build the system that interacts that car to car and car to infrastructure communication into their vehicles and it's not there now. It's something that we're seeing that's happening at the moment from an innovation perspective. But as, as far as dealing with interacting with a device, um, that comes back to the legislation on how you use the road, right? So, uh, and, and that will have to be addressed in that way as well. I think I'd, I'd like to say one. This is basically, it's again a standard issue and a, le a, a legal issue. For example, if you can really have an automated speed control in a, in, a, in a car, in a highway, and that's electronic. It is not really manually you're controlling it. There is a feedback sensor. It measures the speed with which the car goes, and then the accelerator basically is tuned to that. So that's a speed issue. So if it really, whether if it breaks down, then you, have, you will have an accident. So that is basically tested, and that sometimes some vehicles are recalled. In the same way that this particular Internet of Things issue, the automated vehicles, will have that kind of uh, impediment, and that one needs to solve. The, so that's basically the answer. We've heard a bit about disruptive technology and interoperability and the smart city, the concept of it. But the question, I suppose, I'm a, it's a contrary, even almost a cynical view, where we've got a, a country that for 150 years we still can't have interoperability of our train systems and for six months of the year we can't agree on the bloody time, <laughs> what are the sorts of things that these systems are going to drive in terms of making you know, a more livable city rather than just a smart city? It's not a bad point, is it? <laughs> we're, not good at, uh, we're not good at interoperability or we haven't been traditionally as a country. But what I could say is that we know that the trains don't arrive at this thing, and it's painful. Imagine uh, you, you wait endlessly whether the train arrives or not. That's painful. But on the other hand, imagine that you, the train is going to arrive in five minutes or ten minutes late. That's less painful. I think it's the thing is the sophistication with which these things are to be handled. The, we touched upon the interoperability issues. But I think I may be touching a little bit differently. But there is currently what's happening is the, the, there is growth, organic growth depending on the need. There is one side. This, all these operational softwares will come. And that becomes proprietary standards. The nightmare is when several proprietary standards are put together to solve a major problem. That's a nightmare. So therefore, if one has to take a top-down view, OK, this is happening. And we need to really develop systems which can c cut across all the other proprietary standards so that these things can be used bottom down. So that is, a common, that is a major issue that is really taking place. And I hope that these problems are solved, is what you said. Uh, that's a hope, because this, there are so many problems that have been solved um, uh, with the use of uh, this technology. I think this, this, the transportation is, is one of the major problems that will be addressed in this, uh, with this technology. It was suggested earlier that the success of the Internet of Things of everything, smart cities and so on, will depend on people trusting government and big business. So surely it's already a lost cause. Yeah. Well, I, I, yeah. I, I, I can tell you one thing, no, no matter which way you look at it, a lost cause or not, that unless some form of legislation or regulation gets put around us or open standards get put in place or transparency, then this, this thing will evolve in a way that none of us will like. And this is, this is part of the challenge at the moment. We're, we're really at the cusp of this next massive evolution in technology and how that's going to affect us. And that's the question that's out there at the moment. How are we going to deal with all this information? Back to William's point. 
Yeah, yeah. and I think uh, it's, it's more complex uh, that, than that of trust or not, that dichotomy, uh, trust or no trust. We are open, every day we are more open to trade uh, our privacy or our information for free uh, or, or innovative services. We are doing that permanently with our applications. Now with my mobile here, I am declaring my, my position to I don't know how many applications, uh, but because we want free services and we are open to make uh, daily decisions of how we are going to trade with that. So it's, it's not, I think, a position say, Yes or no for my, my whole life, we are permanently uh, making the judgment if we can uh, exchange our information uh, uh, for something that is going to provide some benefit. I, I think that we will go in that direction. I share some of your cynicism, though, and I think it's really important for us to think about our elected officials and think about the civic side of this piece mm -hmm. and their tech savvy. You know, how literate are they with these sort of issues that they're going to have to face and legislate for? We've had worrying decisions on uh, NBN legislation. We've had worrying decisions about privacy going through the Senate recently. And these are sending signals, not just to us as citizens, but to business about the sort of decisions that are going to be made here. Now, we do have some good legislation in place protecting us. The Australian privacy principles, which I mentioned briefly, do have some really um, great standards which particularly apply to government and to businesses over a certain size, so your Cisco's. They don't apply to small fry. Um, so there are some protections there, but I think people need to become increasingly literate about their concerns. There are plenty of open source um, products and uh, plenty of grassroots movements of people wanting to get in this space and solve problems and uh, their options. But, um, you know, you're right, it's about the, the big end of town and, uh, and where that, that lies. So I share your concerns. So I just want to take a point. I think uh, that cynicism it may appear to be valid, but uh, my feeling is there are a lot of. Uh, grassroots movements that have taken place. This organic growth has taken place. For example, if you just look at the couch surfing, is, which, which created about uh, what 1.2 million uh, beds or something like that, uh, and that's phenomenal. That's, that was really happened before. There's all the hotels combined together. They couldn't really match that kind of thing. That's because of the internet. And the other thing is, in similar way, there are a lot of small businesses that are really taking the opportunity to move forward. Uh, uh, IEEE is one of the largest public uh, professional organizations, and that's leading the standards for Internet of Things. That's in the last April, this hey, Seoul, there was a uh, standards meeting which really invited a lot of other small players, including Cisco and other people, to really participate in this uh, meeting so that the standards can take place. Once the standards are there, then small businesses and medium businesses can participate and then come up with the products and services. And that's, uh, that's for everyone to apply. And I don't think uh, the government is really dominating it. I think the government is basically lagging behind, and it's really following. And it's citizens really leading the way at the moment, as I see it. Now, we're over time, and I'm hungry, so we're going to have to wrap this up at this point. Uh, a big thanks to our panel of experts, Professor Maramuthu Palanaswamy from the University of Melbourne, Vanessa Taholka, a broadcaster on technology and culture, and also a knowledge management consultant with the law firm Minter Ellison, Martin Janser van Rensburg from the company Cisco, and William Confalon Ieri, the Chief Digital Officer with Deakin University. Thanks also to uh, Deakin Uni, Federation Square, uh, Radio National, and Jeff Taylor from Melbourne Conversations. And let's give the panelists a, a round of applause. <laughs>